good afternoon and in some cases it may be just uh, morning for some depending on where you are in the country or the world um, to our students um, who are with us this afternoon uh, thank you for joining us for the title nine at american university um, for us to have an opportunity to provide an overview of au's new policy and processes um, i'm fanta i'm the vice president of campus life and inclusive excellence at american university and i'm going to have my colleagues introduce themselves Hi, I'm Seth Grossman. I'm the Vice President of People and External Affairs, and I will be overseeing the new Office of Equity in Title IX, which launches tomorrow. Hi there, I'm Stephen Vaughn. I am the Interim Title IX Program Officer, soon to be identified as the Interim Title IX Coordinator under the new Title IX regulations that we'll discuss shortly. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Porras. I'm the Director of Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution Services. And again, to all of our students, oh, and Michelle, please. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, hi everyone, I apologize, my camera isn't working. Um, my name is Michelle, I'm the Coordinator for Victim Advocacy Services at the Health Promotion Advocacy Center. Thank you, Michelle. Um, to our students who are with us today, first of all, let me start by saying thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, as we've been making our way through these regulations. And uh, thank you for uh, being with us today to learn more about where we are and where we're headed. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna get, uh, we're gonna get started and I'm gonna ask Seth Grossman um, to, kick us up, to kick, it, kick us off for us. Uh, great, thanks Fanta. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so um, two important things are happening tomorrow, the 14th. One is we are officially launching the new Office of Equity in Title IX. Uh, President Burwell announced uh, about a month and a half ago that we were launching this new office that is going to bring together our work on prevention and response to issues of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and other misconduct uh, and discrimination of all types uh, in one office. Uh, and so this office will be responsible uh, for um, Title IX uh, matters. Um, so all formal and informal complaints uh, resolution will now be handled by this office starting tomorrow, uh, and that includes, and we'll talk more about what this means, um, violations under the university's new Title IX sexual harassment policy, and what's non-Title IX sexual misconduct and other kinds of discrimination. And we know that's a little confusing, and we're going to explain more what the differences are in a bit. Um, with this office will also be responsible for training, and we're going to talk about what training we're going to have specific to the Title IX uh, and sexual misconduct context today, although we'll also be handling training across the whole range of its responsibilities. And then third, uh, prevention and awareness program. Again, today we'll focus on the Title IX context, but this office's mandate is much broader. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so one, um, one uh, key uh, responsibility this office is enforcing uh, Title IX. Title IX is a law that was passed by Congress in 1972. And as you can see here on the screen, it provides that no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So that covers almost all universities in the United States, including uh, American University. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, yes, great. Uh, so uh, the department, the Federal Department of Education issued new regulations governing how universities have to implement and handle issues under Title IX. Uh, they were issued, as you can see, on May 6, uh, 2020, uh, and they, became, they become effective tomorrow. That is a very, very, very rapid deadline. Uh, and a much quicker deadline than is usually the case uh, for federal regulations of any type, but especially of this magnitude, which involve both such serious issues and significant changes, uh, as we will talk about uh, later in this webinar. Um, the policy is enforced by the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education. So since May, uh, a group, a working group at the university has been laser focused on developing how the university is going to implement uh, the Title IX regulations, which make a number of changes. Uh, the working group includes representatives uh, of offices who work with students, with faculty, uh, 
with staff uh, and from a number of different perspectives, both from the complaint side, uh, from the uh, support side, uh, and other sides as well. And so uh, the working group uh, has done a really excellent job of working on this very, very tight deadline. Uh, and uh, as we've mentioned, tomorrow we will launch both uh, the new office for uh, Title IX, or for equity in Title IX, and these new policies that uh, implement what is required uh, under the new regulations. Uh, all right, I think someone else is picking up what is changing. Stephen. All right. So as Seth alluded to, there's been some significant change required by the regulations issued by the Department of Education. And just to give you a little bit of background on some of the work that we've been doing, in the, the Title IX has uh, been largely the same from a regulatory standpoint as far as written regulations since the mid 1970s and then when these draft regulations became final regulations earlier this year they did so through about 2,000 pages of content and while the regulations themselves may be about 30 pages long the rest of the information provided by the department of education is used to guide us and in doing this guidance They've made th some things non-negotiable, that we absolutely have to use certain terms, we have to apply certain processes. And then in other ways, the Department of Education has given us some flexibility in how we implement those changes. And we have tried to take advantage of that flexibility in implementing some of these policy changes and have tried to do so in a way that's consistent with what we believe our community standards here are at American University. So let's talk about what is changing. And, and we'll start with the real basic policy standpoint. Prior to this point, we've had a single policy that's used to govern sexual harassment and discrimination at American University, and that's been known as the sexual harassment and discrimination policy. But now we have a new policy, and that policy is the Title IX sexual harassment policy, and that is intended to govern how American University will respond to sexual harassment that fits the definitions of those new regulations. And as we'll discuss shortly, uh, this policy contains specific and a more narrow definition of sexual harassment than American previously used or considered to be sexual harassment that would violate Title IX. And so, uh, American University has taken advantage of some of the flexibility offered by the Title IX regulations to continue to handle sexual misconduct that does not meet those specific definitions from the regulations through a second policy. And that second policy is the discrimination in non-Title IX sexual misconduct policy, which essentially applies to incidents of sexual misconduct that fall outside the scope or the jurisdiction of those Title IX regulations. Next slide, please. And so one of the aspects of the kind of the non-negotiable part of those Title IX regulations is the actual definition of Title IX sexual harassment. And we've provided the text of that definition here. And this is the same text that you'll find in our Title IX sexual harassment policy. And that states a university employee conditioning the provision of university aid, benefit, or service on an individual's participation in unwelcome sexual conduct is one of the ways in which sexual harassment is defined under the regulations. Another definition for it, and, and that's also commonly known as quid pro quo harassment from the Latin term, meaning this for that. The second definition, or sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct determined by a reasonable person to be so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the university's education program or activity. So conduct meeting that definition means that we would be proceeding with a, a case under the Title IX sexual harassment policy. Other aspects of the Title IX sexual harassment definition are sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking that occur within an education 
program or activity. Next slide, please. And so as part of those regulations, the Department of Education has defined when an institution like American University has an obligation to respond to an allegation of sexual harassment. So in order to have the obligation to respond to sexual harassment, an institution has to have what's known as actual knowledge of Title IX sexual harassment within its education programs or activities and that occur in the United States. So that means if we have actual knowledge, we have a legal obligation. To assist our community in understanding who at American University would be a person with, quote, actual knowledge, we have provided that and written it into our policy. And so that would be the Title IX coordinator, that would be the Dean of Students, Vice President of Campus Life, Deputy Provost, Dean of Faculty, Provost, Deans, Assistant Vice President of Human Resources, and Vice President of People and External Affairs. So if those individuals in our community are made aware of sexual harassment, then that triggers our obligation to respond. I will say as an aside, our strong preference remains that if, an, if a student has a concern about sexual harassment, that they go directly to the Title IX coordinator because the Title IX coordinator is essentially charged with quarterbacking the institution's response to sexual harassment or sexual misconduct of any kind and oftentimes is the person in the best position to help. Next slide, please. And so we have uh, other aspects of those regulations that have to be worked into our policy. And so we'll start with the first one here, which is supportive measures. For those who may already be familiar with our process, these are very similar to what we've called interim measures for years. And although these are legal requirements under Title IX, practically speaking, supportive measures are something that we have offered in a similar fashion at American University for an extended period of time now. Supportive measures must be offered equally to complainants and respondents. That's now a legal requirement. And they cannot be perceived as punitive. In other words, they cannot be perceived as taking a disciplinary action against a respondent, for example, prior to the completion of the process. The regulations and our policy now also provide for the emergency removal of a respondent and what the parameters are around that. Just in case you're not familiar with the term respondent, under our policies, that's a person who's been accused of committing sexual harassment or sexual misconduct. And so generally the regulations provide that the only circumstances in which someone can be removed is if there's a threat to the health and safety of others. And in, in responding to those kinds of threats, AU may uh, institute its threat assessment team after receiving a formal requ request or a formal complaint. And then in any event, the person who's been removed will have a chance under the policy to immediately challenge that removal. The regulations also require that American University and other institutions have an estimated timeline for resolution. Our current policy provides for 60 days and taking into consideration all of the procedural requirements by the new regulations, we have changed that number to 90 days. Next slide, please. Another thing that is changing and, and is a result of those regulations, and that is for many years now, the Department of Education has discouraged the use of informal resolution in cases involving sexual assault or other sexual misconduct. The draft regulations provide that informal resolution can be used as a tool. And that may be an option, unless it's a circumstance where a student is accusing an employee of sexual assault, dating violence, sexual violence or stalking, or of sexual harassment. And there are certain parameters around the use of the informal resolution. And so some of those are that there has to be written notice to the parties. Both parties would have to consent to the resolution. If, it does, if it's not successful, then you would go through a formal process. And then in any event, if the parties believe they've reached an agreement about how sexual harassment involving them should be addressed, the Title IX coordinator and the university do have some say 
and how that looks in the end and what happens if the parties don't abide by that agreement. Next slide, please. Another thing that's changed and, and that is under the formal regulations and, and the, um, sorry, I, I've lost my thought there. Uh, you see a reference here to formal complaints. And so the regulations describe what a formal complaint is. And when a, a, a member of our community comes forward with a formal complaint, meaning they're making a complaint in writing about actions that would violate our sexual harassment policy, and they request that the institution go forward, American University go forward with an investigation, then uh, American University has to evaluate that formal complaint and determine first if it would meet the definition of sexual harassment. If it does not meet the definition of sexual harassment under the Title IX regulations, then American University is required to dismiss that complaint. And what that means is we would not be go going forward with that complaint under the Title IX sexual harassment policy. However, that does not mean that it won't be addressed. We are permitted to then go to our other policy, our non-Title IX sexual harassment policy, and determine whether it might be a violation of that policy and then proceed under the provisions of that policy if it is. Another instance in which we would be required to dismiss is if the conduct occurred outside a university education program or activity, or if it occurred against somebody who was not in the United States. So those are required, non-negotiable. American University has the ability to exercise some discretion about dismissing formal complaints and, and those are in circumstances where the complainant might seek to withdraw their complaint or if the respondent is no longer enrolled in the university or an employee of the university or if the circumstances prevent us from being able to go forward with the complaint. I'll tell you that last one would be a very rare circumstance and it would be limited typically to a circumstance where the person who's brought the complaint, the complainant, does not want to participate in an investigation anymore or American University decides without the information that that person could provide, there would be no ability to go forward with the case. Next slide, please. So there's some other changes that are required. The first here is advisors. American University has long permitted and provided the opportunity for its students to have advisors if they're going through our process. It's that second bullet that represents a change. And that is, um, as part of a live hearing, the advisors are permitted to engage in cross-examination. So they get to ask witnesses and the other parties what, um, uh, questions about those allegations during a live hearing. Otherwise, adv advisors are pretty passive in their interactions with American University through our processes. Review of the preliminary investigative report and findings. So all complainants and respondents will have the opportunity to review reports and any evidence that are collected and they'll have 10 days to do so. Those 10 days are required by the Title IX regulations. And one of the most significant changes that are required by these regulations is the next one, and that's the live hearing requirement. So if it is a case that is proceeding under the Title IX definition of sexual harassment, then a live hearing is required. And the live hearing would be presided over by a a three member panel who would be responsible for making a decision about whether or not the policy was violated. Additionally, as part of that hearing process, both parties would have to make themselves available for cross-examination if they choose to participate in the hearing. And they would not be able to ask questions of the other parties directly. They would have to do that through the use of their advisors. Next slide, please. And so the regs uh, had the regulations had provided some flexibility, as I mentioned before. And the, here's another instance of that flexibility. The regulations allow us to de make determinations about who gets to decide these cases and even who gets to decide the sanctions. 
And so American has decided that they will impanel sanctions panels as part of um, their process, its process, and they will make recommendations about the sanctions once there's a finding of responsibility. The composition of that panel will vary depending on the status of the respondent, whether the respondent is a student or employee or faculty member. And then both parties have the opportunity to participate through oral or written statements with the sanctions panel. The regulations specifically require that we have appeals available to both parties and the appeals can take a number are, are applicable to a number of parts of our process. Earlier, you heard me talk about dismissal when a case may be dismissed or must be dismissed under Title IX. And so if a case is dismissed, either party has the opportunity to appear, appeal that dismissal at that time. Parties also have the opportunity to appeal a case once a decision has been made or once sanctions have been opposed. And it, again, this is something that would apply to both parties. The regulations also provide those specific appeal grounds, which will be included in American universities policies. Okay, so Stephen has talked a little bit about what is changing. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is staying the same. So Stephen mentioned that the Department of Education and regulations stated that behavior that falls outside of the scope of the new Title IX definitions, the universities can determine if they address them under a, another policy. What AU has decided to do is, is we will have a different policy that's, that is the former discrimination and sexual misconduct policy. It's now called the discrimination and non-Title IX sexual misconduct policy. And that'll address any of the conduct that falls outside of the scope of the new Title IX definitions. Um, this it will remain an investigator process, which means that an investigator um, would address the allegation through an investigation where both parties would have the opportunity um, to present information, evidence, and witnesses. The investigator would make a determination whether or not a policy was violated. And then if a policy was violated for the student process, it would be addressed through a sanction panel in the Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution Services Office. Um, and we would also manage the appeals. Another thing that's not changing is the standard of evidence. We will continue to use the standard of the preponderance of the evidence, which means it is more likely than not that the policy was or wasn't violated. And the last thing that's not changing is our duty to report as faculty and staff um, at the university. So all faculty, staff, and student employees will have will continue to have a duty to report discriminatory or harassing conduct, and all other members of the community are encouraged to report discriminatory or harassing conduct. And one of the things that's important to remember is that when we say reporting, we're reporting this to the Office of Equity in Title IX, but that is not the uh, reporting of a formal complaint. This is simply a way for the Office of Equity in Title IX to provide supportive measures to any students that have um, faced discriminatory or harassing conduct. Next slide. All right, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, uh, Stephen and Katie have ably covered uh, what's changing and what's saying the same. Um, and uh, we have gotten some questions about what happens if the university doesn't comply. Obviously, the regulations, as um, Stephen outlined, make a lot of very significant changes, uh, changes that the university is uh, required to make. Um, and we uh, uh, said, well, what, where do we have discretion? Where don't we? And one place we don't have discretion is adopting the parameters that Stephen outlined then. The, uh, most notably, if we don't comply with them, we face uh, the loss of federal funding, which includes the student financial aid that so many of our students rely upon, and the research grants and contracts that fuel our research and the work that faculty do often with students. If you'll recall, the um, definition of Title IX that we talked about right at the beginning, uh, it's premised on those who um, who receive federal funding, and that is the, the tool or the consequence the federal government has. There's also other steps they can take uh, against the university, uh, including investigations and imposing other kinds of penalties and sanctions. So we've tried, we've, uh, as um, 
Linfanta and um, Stephen Nintier, we tried to adopt approach where we're complying with the regulations, but in a way that we think matches the AU's philosophy and approach uh, of these issues before. And so we're trying to, to um, walk uh, that middle ground between those two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the training. So uh, as I mentioned, um, one key uh, aspect of the new Office of Equity and Title IX Studies is going to be education and training, um, and that will start uh, with the training related to Title IX. Uh, the training is going to take uh, a couple of different forms uh, across different populations. So um, all investigators, so all of the people that are in the process that Stephen and Katie discussed will receive a special uh, training tailored to people investigators about the both about the new rule but also about the best practices for handling these kinds of investigations um, there will be training uh, tailored to decision makers uh, so that as you see here and as you'll recall includes the people on the panels uh, the live hearing panels the appeals decision makers and then university administrators with oversight of the process and then finally the general community students faculty and staff receive training and that training will also take different forms. There'll be a mix of online and in-person and the in-person training will often be adopted and tailored depending on the particular type of population. So there'll be a lot of different training here. And um, before I turn it over to Michelle, I just wanted to emphasize again, today we're talking about the Title IX aspects and the sexual uh, misconduct and assault part of it. And that's the because of uh, largely driven by this uh, federal deadline. That's the way the office is kicking off, but the training and education programs the office will do are going to go far beyond uh, the Title IX issues to encompass all the work they're doing. So there'll be more to come on that, but today we're talking about the Title IX sexual misconduct, sexual harassment part of it. Uh, and I will turn to Michelle, I think. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, so I know that was a lot of information, um, and we understand that that can be overwhelming to hear. And so we want you all to know that we are here uh, for support, and there are resources for you all. So I just wanted to highlight some of those. Um, the first one is um, HPAC's Office of Advocacy Services for Interpersonal and Sexual Violence. You most likely heard it as OASIS. Um, I'm one of the OASIS advocates, I'm the primary advocate, so um, if you have any concerns, need any support, um, need to get connected to services um, as it relates to sexual violence or interpersonal violence or stalking, um, I'm here to help support you. Um, my coworker Val Tovar is the other advocate uh, in OASIS, so you can book an appointment with us on our You Can Book Me online, and we are holding um, virtual appointments. So. Our services hasn't, haven't changed at all, um, except that we're virtual now. So um, we're still here to support you all. Um, there are lots of other departments on campus, such as AU Counseling Center. They're also providing virtual services. Um, the Health Center is still providing in-person services. Um, and K Spiritual Life Center is providing virtual services as well. Those four resources are all confidential. Um, and so, information that you tell them will stay with them. And as far as OASIS goes, any information that you talk to Val or I about will stay confidential. So we will not report that to Title IX. Um, finally, the Dean of Students Office is still operating, as well as the Center for Advocacy and Student Equity case. Um, they have student advocates and advisors who can provide assistance in understanding university policies and procedures. Um, and you can also um, look them up online. So for all these services, if you have any questions about how resources look like now, um, now that we're all virtual, just check out their websites um, and any updated information should be on there. Um, and finally, if you have any questions about anything that was mentioned during the webinar today, um, you can email um, the Title IX or the Equity Office's emails that are on the screen, um, as well as check out the Equity and Title IX Office website online. Um, so yeah, I will turn over to questions right now. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mickey Irizarry, and I'm the director at the Health Promotion and Advocacy Center. I'm going to welcome all of our panelists back on screen uh, for the Q&A portion. So first, um, I just want to thank everyone for providing this detailed information. And if you have any questions um, as an attendee, please feel free to use the Q&A box um, in the GoToWebinar 
um, screen on your right hand side. So you can go ahead and input questions and I will kind of ask them out to the panelists and whoever feels most comfortable answering that question will take the question. Okay, the first question is, when will we find out about the new AVP for the Office of Equity in Title IX? Good question. Uh, so we're in the final stage of the process and we hope we'll have it announced uh, by the end of the month. Thank you, Seth. Um, second question is, um, what is an example of an informal resolution? Sorry about that. Uh, so I would say typically what people think of when they think of informal resolution is some form of mediation. And a mediation typically takes place where you have two parties. So here it would be a complainant and a respondent that are working through some sort of interme intermediary to reach a resolution. And you could envision that being a circumstance where a, compl a complainant is meeting with somebody at the university out of this office saying here's what happened because they would have to provide a formal complaint and and here's what i would like to see done about it and then the respondent would have an opportunity to meet with that person and say well here's the i understand what those circumstances are here's what i have to say about it and here's what i would like to see done as a resolution of this process and then american would weigh in and make sure that any kind of resolution of that nature was acceptable to American and consistent with how it handles such matters. Thank you. Um, our next question is, since it is a legal requirement, will we have respondent support services? Am I answering this one? Yeah, so we we want to make sure that respondents have opportunities to find uh, support uh, as they're going through these processes as well. And we do have some of those in place already to help with the process. And so we're taking a look at all of the ways that we can make sure that they have uh, the resources that are available for complainants as well. Thank you. Um, next question, how will the university protect students while the process remains co confidential? Mickey, I'm assuming that the question, because I'm trying to make sure that I'm reading, I'm understanding the question correctly. Uh, by protect, I'm assuming I can see it on, on a lot of levels. How do you protect that as making sure that you provide all the resources and, and, and adequate support would be one way that I would uh, read the support, uh, the, the, the protect. And in this instance, um, you know, as Michelle has outlined, is making sure that all of our resources around support are there for students and to ensure that. The other piece as well is that in having the confidentiality piece, that's a very important part of the process as has been outlined. Now, with that said, I think this is where there sometimes has been um, some challenges, is the institution is bound by the confidentiality requirements. The parties, sometimes that is not as clear. And so I'd like Stephen to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so under the regulations, American University is not permitted to do what I would describe as sort of a gag order provision. And what that means is we cannot turn to a complainant or respondent and say, you're not allowed to talk about this. And if you read a lot of the information provided by the Department of Education, you could see one of the things that institutions nationwide have been grappling with is the exercise of free speech and wanting to make sure that policies and procedures did not impair an individual's ability to exercise their free speech and also impair their ability to go through the process and collect information that is necessary to address the allegations. 
And so there's a real fine line there and it can be a very difficult thing because we recognize anybody involved in this process is going to suffer in one way or another. But we can't prevent people from trying to collect information that's important to their case. We can't prevent them from trying to talk about it with others. Uh, what we can ask is that they stay within the scope of of the investigation when they're having those conversations and they're they're having the supportive conversations that they need with people that they can engage in privileged relationships but it's a really difficult thing uh, on our end we do everything that we can to keep these investigations confidential we do have legal obligations about our student records and it's really important that we adhere to that and then the final thing i'll say about it is we do have policies against retaliation so if it seems that information is being shared for some other purpose and it's to prevent somebody from participating or punish them for participating in our process, then we take claims of retaliation extremely seriously. And just to add on to that, um, to Stephen and Fanta, um, you know, Oasis is here, as I mentioned, for support. Um, and although we can't provide any legal advice, um, I wish I could. <laughs> um, we can connect you with attorneys. Um, we partner with a lot of local um, advocacy centers um, and legal aid offices in the DC area. Um, Val and I personally know a lot of attorneys that do this type of work. So if you ever need a referral or a connection so that someone can answer some of that those legal questions, um, Oasis can help you with that as well. And added to that under the protection clause as well is if in the process there are other violations of the code of conduct. Um, and if you have other violations of the code of conduct, then those are other also things that you know would allow us to, to have some protective measures as a result of those violations as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, next question is, when will we learn more about how the office will be handling bias and discrimination on campus? Another good question. Uh, so we will have more information on that in the um, coming weeks. Uh, once the new AVP is hired, they'll talk about it. It's going to be a multifaceted plan. Part of it is um, uh, is you know we have created after a year of analysis and effort the framework for this office. Uh, but building out that framework uh, is going to be a collaborative process between the AVP, that person's team and the campus community. And so there's a lot of work about, we have some programs to launch, but a lot of it is still building out and developing it to make sure it's responsive to the needs of the community. So it'll be both um, a mix of announcements of some early stage um, uh, activities, engagements and interventions, and then a step of a broad consultation in a lot of different ways as we're working collaboratively to structure this new office uh, here at AU. Thank you, Seth. Next question, um, potentially for Katie and or Stephen. Would potential sanctions for respondents differ to be more or less severe if a student, uh, if a complainant goes through one policy versus the other or one process versus the other than Title IX or non-Title IX? That's a great question. Um, for student respondents, the sanctions that uh, would be eligible in both processes are outlined in the Student Conduct Code. And the panels are going to be trained to evaluate it on a number of considerations, everything from the severity of the behavior um, to evaluating whether the respondent presents a continued risk or threat um, to the campus community. Um, so I don't think that it would differentiate based on the process that someone goes through because it would be an evaluation of behavior. Thank you. Um, let's see. What if a student's case meets the Title IX definition, but that student would prefer to use the investigator model? Is that an option? No. If it meets the Title IX definition for sexual harassment, that is the process the law requires that we use. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and could Stephen, uh, could you give an example of um, from the first, with the definition being 
behavior that happens in a university education program or activity. Um, could you give an example of um, a sexual uh, what would happen with a uh, for the process of a sexual assault is occurring, say, at an AU Founders Ball uh, event versus um, an informal party at a uh, fraternity and sorority house? Sure, because that's one of the more important distinctions that the regulations require us to make. So if it's in, within an educational activity, so if it's at the Founders Ball, for example, then that would trigger our obligations under Title IX if it, as long as the conduct itself. So let's say it was a sexual assault because we know that would. And, and that's to be differentiated from something is outside of program or activity. And so if it was at some after party across town at a place that has nothing to do with American University, then it would, and assuming the parties are affiliated with American University, then it would proceed under the non-Title IX policy. Another important distinction to recognize between the two there would be study abroad programs. So the requirement is that this impacts somebody in the United States. So you, if you are an, an AU student studying in a study abroad program outside the United States, that formal Title IX sexual harassment policy and process would not apply. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Attendees, if you do have any other questions that we will give it a few more minutes um, for additional questions to be put into the, the box um, for us to ask our panelists. Are there any other comments that the panelists would like to make? Yeah, no, the, the one thing I wanted to kind of come back to Mickey is that, you know, as Seth um, and others have outlined, um, have, you know, for the working group, that has poured over really the the, um, the regulations and the extensive um, sort of number of regulatory you know elements that were there. Um, the group really tried to work to strike that balance of what was absolutely necessary by regulations um, and in, in ensuring that there's full compliance while also really making sure that we provide avenues that really take into account the educational environment that we want to have for our students. Um, and that was uh, the balance. And so I can hear and I can appreciate in the question from our students, this question about, you know, what happens if, you know, there's a, there's a conduct, but do I have the option to go one way or the other? And that was something we certainly looked at and the regulations, you know, unfortunately is quite clear about the fact that there is no, um, there is no discretion on that front. Well, the other comment, uh, making the other comment I wanted to quickly make um, to follow up also on Seth's comment um, is the question that was asked about the, the office um, and the bias response um, and the work that's there. And as Seth outlined, the iterative process um, that, that that would involve. Um, one of the, the things that I know some students were engaged with last year was the bias uh, response working group. And that group did put in quite a bit of work in identifying areas and measures um, that you know they, uh, that that were proposed to kind of help us along the response to bias, and I want to assure that those to those students who were involved um, and the community members who were engaged with that 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 document will be part of our framework as the office sort of begins to proceed. We will have that also as part of our framework of some of the work that's already been done, so that we're not reinventing the wheel where we don't have to, but instead of build from that is the only other thing that I wanted to kind of share with our with our community. I just wanted to add that for those of you that are interested in reviewing the policies, the Student Conduct Code is live on the American University Policy Library, and it includes the discrimination and non-Title IX sexual misconduct policy and the Title IX sexual harassment policy. And Katie, in addition, it also includes um, sort of the changes that we've made around the bias bias incidents as well, uh, which was one of the things that came out of the bias response working group um, and in, in us responding to that as well. There, there is another question that came in. 
Um, should continuing students at the Washington College of Law expect additional training and or education about this policy? And actually, I can answer a little bit of that. Um, uh, so for the entire student community, regardless if you are an undergraduate student, new returning graduate student, new or returning WCL, we will be re um, requiring all students to go through an online module course through our EverFi partners. Um, and each uh, different populations will receive a different course. And a lot of this information about this new policy will be integrated into that course um, or those courses. So freshmen, uh, and new in undergraduate students will receive a course called Sexual Assault Prevention for Undergraduates. Uh, continuing students at the undergraduate level will receive a course called Sexual Assault Prevention Ongoing Healthy Relationships. And new and returning graduate students will receive a course called Sexual Assault Prevention Graduates. Um, and that will, will also be applicable to WCL. And each course, like I said, will have components of our new policy procedures incorporated in the course so you can learn a little bit more about this subject area, specifically, again, about sexual assault and other Title IX um, behaviors. More information and education will be coming out later on once our new AVP is hired um, about bias and discrimination. And Mickey, to add to that, I think in addition to the training, I will also continue to have some of these community webinars as the semester unfolds, knowing that there will be members of our community who would want to kind of get a refresher on that as well. So that is certainly something that we've done routinely and that we want to do. And certainly um, when the new AVP comes, um, there'll be some of those as well. Um, one thing I did want to add is that, um, you know, although there are going to be many opportunities for students to, you know, learn about the new policies and understand them, we also don't expect you all to be experts on them. It's confusing, it's hard, it's overwhelming, and know that it's our jobs to be the experts on that. And so we're here if you ever have a question, if you need support during the process, it's not something that you're going to have to memorize and know how to do and be able to do it on your own. So we're always here to answer your questions and support you through whatever process um, you decide to go through. And to add to what Michelle talked about, because we know that it can be complicated, um, one of the things also that's part of the, uh, the sort of the education are flowcharts that kind of help you understand, you know, what happens when you first start here and what, you know, what's the next step and so forth. So there are other tools that are being built in and to kind of help with sort of understanding the different steps and stages of this. But more than anything else, when in doubt, make sure you reach out. And with that, I think we will close out. Thank you all to the attendees for joining us today and taking time out of your afternoons or mornings, wherever you are in the world, um, to learn more about our new policy and procedures and guidelines. Um, and thank you again to our panelists for providing such detailed and thorough information and for answering our questions today. This session will be recorded or is being recorded, was recorded, and uh, will be uploaded as well for other students who were not able to view it today. Thank you, everybody, and good luck with the start of the semester.